everybody. Welcome to this uh, stream for MadCon, Mad Collective. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Michael Pryor. I'm a computational designer currently at Nike, um, trained as an architect, uh, author of Grasshopper plugin uh, Pufferfish, uh, <clears throat> and been doing uh, you know mostly computational design um, for about ten or so. 10 or so years now. Um, so we'll just kick this off with a presentation. And actually, during the presentation, I'll uh, switch back and forth between uh, my main tool, which is Rhino Grasshopper, just to explain some things uh, as we go along um, with the presentation. Uh, feel free to leave some comments. Uh, and let's, let's, get this thing, uh, let's get this thing going. Uh, so as I said, my name is Michael Pryor, computational designer uh, at Nike, and I see digital innovation, um, design director of Design Morphine, um, and the author of Pufferfish Grasshopper 3D Plugin. Uh, now, my career is a little bit crazy and uh, all over the place, um, and it's because of computational design really that allowed me to, you know, access all these different design fields. Um, and what I'm doing mostly in computational design is creating um, tools and workflows that kind of optimize uh, workflows. So here's like a, a kind of a little chart of my my career path and trajectory. As I said, it's kind of been all over the place, um, starting at NYIT, uh, New York Institute of Technology, uh, as an architect um, uh, major in New York. Um, and from there, I kind of split off into two different uh, kind of paths. One was an education path, and the other is my you know, um, work and career path. Um, and throughout all that, there was many different uh, collaborations and opportunities, um, but not always architecture related. And that was because of the kind of the, the methodology um, of computational design as a, as a problem solver that could be applied to you know, all kinds of design aspects. And funny enough, uh, you know, all the way at the top, you'll see social media. Uh, social media played a big role in, in my kind of career path as well. Uh, most of my opportunities came from, you know, social media. You know, even my, my current job at Nike, you know, came from uh, an Instagram uh, message. So kind of importance of that is, is always on my, my timeline here and then you know, softwares as well. Um, so as a computational designer, um, well, again, like I said, I make tools uh, tools and workflows and optimizations that are then distributed to you know other individuals and designers. Um, and I'm doing the same even you know kind of on my free time with my Grasshopper plugins, right, to kind of enable and empower people to to work more <clears throat> kind of uh, efficiently and not have to be bogged down with things that really aren't necessary to to repeat and do every time. Um, and you know, a lot of this comes from from our work as Design Morphine. If you don't know Design Morphine, you can follow there at Design Morphine, um, uh, which is a kind of a community we've been building over the past uh, seven or so years, um, teaching workshops, uh, and now because of COVID, webinars uh, around the world, interacting with many students, seeing how kind of all these people work, uh, how they work together, um, what kind of problems they have, what are the challenges of getting someone to use complex softwares in a short amount of time. You start to see the kind of the bottlenecks, uh, and those are the things that I look for and try to alleviate. And if you don't know, if you're not familiar with even Grasshopper or what Powerfish is, um, it's a plugin that I've made that's for Grasshopper, it's 318 components, uh, which blends focus on like tweens, blends, morphs, averages, and transformations. Uh, all things that are pretty common in the kind of design that I do. Um, and I like to look at this 
quote from uh, Bill Gates, where I choose a lazy person to do a hard job. A lazy person will find an easy way to do it. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean like, you know, actually a lazy person, but, you know, the, the, the sentiment is that, like, people that will find quick, efficient, and optimized and often automated ways to perform uh, redundant tasks uh, so that they don't have to. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the other benefit of this is, is uh, you know, just not having to redo things and repeat things. And, and if, uh, you know, funny enough, if you look um, at Autodesk's, uh, if you look at their information, they have information about each one of their softwares and all the um, all the commands that are used and what they're used in, in, in conjunction with. Uh, and funny, you know, funny enough, with each one, uh, the most common things are erasing and deleting and undoing. Um, so we spend a lot of time uh, as designers, you know, redoing things, deleting things, making a lot of mistakes, um, or or just being uncertain. But anytime you erase or delete or undo something, uh, means you have to do it, you know, again or do it some way. So the idea is like, you know, how do we not have to redo things all the time, even if we do need to go back. Um, and I like to look at this <clears throat> this simple example of something like a grid. Um, you know, if we were to draw, you know, if we were to, you know, draw a grid, it's pretty like, you know, it's pretty easy. But also, is it really necessary? The actual drawing of the grid, if we know that we want a grid, so. Basically, you know, if you wanted a grid and you know you wanted a grid, is it really necessary to get a ruler, take a pencil, or even in the computer, draw each line and make a, make a grid, right? So that, that part is what we consider the, you know, you know, if you boil it down to kind of oversimplified ways, that's kind of what we're trying to remove from the equation is the actual creating of the thing so that you can just have the thing that you know that you need. Um, and, and this is just in Rhino. You know, if you look at um, how would you create a grid, you can see up here all the kind of times you would need to do something like this, like to, to make a grid, you have to draw, draw a line, copy it over and over and over, draw another line, copy it over and over and over. And then there's some shortcuts like arraying and, and whatnot, but they still require a lot of inputs, and you can do macros as well. Um, hey, but, Michael? yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I don't think we can see your screen yet. Do you mind just sharing it? Uh, it said it was sharing. Weird. Okay. Is it sharing now? Yeah, we've got it. Great. Okay, I'll just go. I'll just go really quickly back, and then it's fine. Um, so that was weird because it said it was sharing. Anyway, um, so yeah. So as I was saying, um, you know, this was kind of the chart I was talking about, where my career kind of went into two different lanes um, and all these different opportunities here. Um, and design morphine so at design morphine um and then kind of all the workshops and venues we're doing uh, experiencing with the students and seeing their workflows um pufferfish uh which i was saying is the kind of plugin that we're we're using all the time <clears throat> that i created that's you know kind of looks at these things and alleviates those issues um and then these were the charts i was talking about with AutoCAD, you can find these uh, online. Um, they're really interesting charts and they're super high resolution. You can kind of zoom into them um, and you can see the, you know, erase, delete, undo. Um, and this was, I was just talking about with the grid, like drawing the grid here uh, manually. And this is where I was at now. So with Rhino, where if you were to draw a grid like this, you would have to, you know, for instance, draw a line and then copy it, copy it, copy it, or offset, offset, offset. Um, or you can do shorter things like arrays, but still takes uh, 
quite a bit of input and you can also macro that but even with the macro you need to still give it inputs and if you want to start over you would have to delete that and start the macro over um, and that's where we move into things like grasshopper down here um, where all of that kind of pre-setup is erased from the equation and you just have the inputs and those inputs are dynamic and so that's the kind of simplified version of 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 what you know what i look for and what i do is like how do you remove the unnecessary pre-setup that you you don't need when you know kind of you know you want a grid you should just be able to have a grid in in the sizes um that you want so if i go you know again if we just look at this real quick um if i go in rhino you know to make a grid you know, I have to do something like that. And then I can, you know, if I offset it uh, something, right? And then I can offset, offset, offset. And of course you can do things like, you can do things like, uh, you know, like move things this and, you know, whatever kind of shortcuts you do um, to make a grid. Um, but, it's still kind of a hassle and takes a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of time if you're doing even more complex things where with, you know, something like Grasshopper, you can just get a, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can just get a grid kind of component or, or node. Um, and it's basically it's there, right? Like you're not anymore drawing it or having to set that up. And you're basically just then inputting values to create the grid that you want to create. Um, so that's that's kind of the uh, the idea there, um, and the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. And then you know, if I need to change this, it's all dynamic, and I can just change it, and we're good to go. So the other benefits of, um, you know, the other benefits of <clears throat> the, the other benefit of this kind of uh, workflow optimization is that the tools become also more usable um, because you can embed more, you can embed more intelligence in them and more flexibility and more usability. Um, so in this case, you know, if we actually list out the rules um, uh, of a grid, we can then say, okay, let's not make this flat anymore. We can just apply it to other things. You can apply it to a surface or apply it to anything else. Um, you know, and the way that, you know, the way that this happens is if you have a task, um, you should list it out. So in this case, like define a square surface for grid, draw a line, the size of the U, offset the line in the V. So you start to list out the steps. And if if there's anything you want to do that you can list out the steps, that means it can be automated. Um, so if, if it's something you can't think about how to list up the steps in a, in a kind of definitive way, um, it might not be something that you can automate or it might take further thinking. But if it's something that you can list it out, um, and I just really like to use this grid example because I think it's just really simple uh, to understand. If you had to draw a grid, it's easy for you to list the steps of how to draw a grid. Like if you had to, if you had to give someone a set of instructions written how to draw a grid, those, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can take and embed in something like uh, Grasshopper or a macro logic, or uh, in my case, uh, like you see in the top right here scripting um, and not everyone needs to be able to script i'm not saying to optimize your workflow you need to be able to script but there are tools and ways or even just different ways of thinking about things that can get you to you know to that point so if i if i for instance uh, you know with with one of my uh, components here um uh and pufferfish for instance 
Um, if I did a, uh, you know, parameter surface, if I did a surface grid, right? Like, so uh, if I wanted to do a flat grid, uh, just go, okay, yeah. Uh, range. So now I have, you know, these parametric controls over a grid here. But what it, what I can do that you know you wouldn't be able to do with a manual thing is I can then do whatever I want with this surface, and the grid will always kind of conform to it, and that's the that's what we're looking for also is more usability for your logics so that they're not just you know stuck to you know one way of working. Um, so even if I you know deform this grid. Uh, this surface, I still have, you know, the answer that I'm looking for there. Okay. So that's that's the idea there. Um, <clears throat> so you know, if you took that kind of to the next, you know, the next level, um, you know, something like things that are coming out like Finch 3D. Um, and other, you know, I'm just thinking about grids now and grids and architecture. Um, you know, you can embed all these things in, in all very complex relationship ways um, to automate a lot of this stuff for you. Because again, even with architecture, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of definite rules that can be embedded into the logic in the way that we occupy and use um, a space. Um, and you know, if you can get those instructions, I've got a lot more instructions here than a simple grid, you can you know, develop these kind of tools. And so you see here that you know, there's a kind of floor plan adopting two different outlines and different perimeters. Um, same here. And you can even take that further with something like, you know, even more complex in three dimensionality, uh, like Zaha uh, Code is doing, where it also involves the client, right? So things are even so simple, uh, and not simple under the hood, but simple enough to use that uh, someone that doesn't even know about architecture um, can use it uh, and define and select and pick spaces that they you know they want to you know purchase or occupy without having to worry about the technicalities of um, zoning codes and, and you know, egress and, and the size of rooms should be uh, almost like a video game You know, in the case of in a case of those kind of things, you know, a lot of people uh, tend to be scared of that. This, you know, there's there's a kind of big opinion. It's like, well, then doesn't that take the architect's job or this or that? And you know, in in my personal opinion, I would say that it, if anything, it liberates um, designers. Uh, in this case, architect architects uh, for the examples here. Um, you know, to be able to worry more about the the design and less about the kind of knowns that that we know that we have to have anyway. Um, and I would even argue that we've already been doing this for a while, just more manually. Um, I'm sure you know any of you that are architects have had one of these books or some version or some other kind of book like this, where you're having references to other floor plans or even. You know, CAD blocks, right? 
So you're, you're, you know, we're already using all these things. We're already referencing these things. We're already looking at building standards that have to be incorporated into um, our spaces and buildings. Uh, and all you're really doing is using computing power to automate all that, take all that information uh, and have a computer run through options um, based on your intent or outline um, to try to figure out you know what what you're trying to do um, so I, I mean in you know in my opinion there's no difference between you know using references like this um, versus doing something like this except for you know this is a lot faster and can out, output a lot of options for you you know, quicker um, so you know in 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 the case of computational design um, and these things that I'm doing you know the designer becomes more of a, a Kind of a, a rule set and system designer and a curator of of, uh, of options. Um, you know, and there's a lot of benefits to opt automation in 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 this kind of work and design work, uh, which is to reduce redundant repetitive work, get time to focus on more important tasks. Uh, you reduce human errors in repeated operations. Um, you know, if you can code it correctly you just really have to fix bugs if you have bugs and then once that's fixed it's distributed amongst the system and everyone that's using it you know has those fixes uh you improve productivity speed and execution again the computer you know if a computer has the rules it can think uh, and produce a lot quicker than we can um you remove uh learning curve and training efforts um, if you can give someone a system as simple as uh, the Zaha, you know, as simple as the Zaha setup there, where it's like, you know, really point and click without worrying about if something is wrong, uh, something is the wrong size, right? Uh, and you get integration and, and distribution of this workflows. <clears throat> so that brings me to um, Pufferfish and kind of a, a big reason of why I created it. Um, and if you don't know um, Pufferfish, you can find it on foodforino.com slash app slash Pufferfish. Um, it's, I would say, four years old now. Um, quite uh, popular with 133,000 plus downloads. Uh, and you can see the kind of versions here. And there's like super, like a lot of example files that'll get you up and going pretty, pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one of the main reasons I started making this, uh, I started making uh, Pufferfish was that I was working at the uh, office before going to Nike, which was Trahan Architects, a really, really great office with a lot of fun, fun design challenges. Um, and when I came in there working on this theater, uh, which is called the Alliance Theater, and, uh, you know, it was already like pretty well into its documentation and design phase. Um, and I wasn't really on the project so much. But being part of the, uh, you know, being part of this, you know, team and office, I got to see a lot of the challenges there. Uh, and one thing that was really interesting to me was the, you know, the problem of how do you map all these wood, wood strips on this, you know, humongous theater in a more automated uh, and technical way. Um, and you can even see here, like on site, what they did was they put these giant lasers around um, and mapped them. Um, but how do we kind of get that to documentation? Um, and you can see here, like some of the some of the details of that. And you know, these these uh, strips were performative, meaning they were open when they needed to, yeah, you know, sandwich between them. There's kind of as absorption panels. Uh, so when they're open, they need to absorb sound. Uh, when they're closed, uh, we can use that to direct and bounce sound to different areas of the uh, of the seating. And that's what a lot of these curvatures were for too. If you see on the kind of underbelly, this curvature more solid, 
which would you know bounce sounds you know down to the the seats below um here would be you know where it's open sound would go through and hit the absorb absorption panels uh within and you know if you look at a <clears throat> If we look at a surface, I mean, the, the challenge was in, in 3D programs, uh, I mean, just kind of a funny challenge because the way the surface a surface is made um, in a software like Rhino, there's always this kind of underlying grid. Um, and you you don't want to be in, in the design of the, the uh, space and the construction you don't want to be stuck with having to just use those because the, the lines that make up the surface might not be the lines that make sense for the design. Um, you know, so here I'm showing, you know, if you just took those lines and kind of were conformed to them, what you would have is you know, something like this, which might not make sense for the performance aspects, whereas something like this here, you can see here, like I'm, I'm you know, going against the curvature of the geometry, for instance, here, creating a, a pinch to tighten those wood pieces to, to potentially get a bounce uh, of sound there or an absorption of sound here. Um, so, you know, what that grid looks like, if I just quickly, uh, if I just quickly make something here, uh, Just gonna quickly just pull this around. Just make some something, and just pull this up. So if I have something like that. You can see already like where that line is, right? You can see those there. And if I took this in here uh, and I did, let's say, uh, if I extract the wireframe, so you can see it. So you see those lines there? That's kind of like the lines that are following the surface, but they're not necessarily the lines we need. Um, so if I bring this in, I can do uh, something like a divide, divide surface so you can see more clearly. So those are like the lines that we're talking about there. You can see the flow of that, but we don't really want, you know, that again, like that doesn't really make sense to us. Um, so the tool that I ended up making <coughs> here, which uh, in Rhino called uh, blending is called basically like tweening when you're blending objects from one object to another. Um, and the, you know, here you can see that there's kind of, uh, you know, you have case kind of surface plus input driving curves, and you can blend between them along a surface. Now, Rhino, <clears throat> for instance, Rhino and other tools, they, I mean, we already have here between, between curve, right? So if I just type like between curves, uh, and you can just put the number and you can get that right but there's no good way or easy way to get that on to this surface here um you know the way that we would do it the way that we have to do it and i'll just show you because you can see how painful it would be for an, aud an auditorium of that size and that amount of documentation is you would have kind of some driving I'll just draw. You'd have some kind of driving curve here. Right, something like that. What you would do is 
you would first um, you would create a UV curve and uh, right so that gives you like the flattened boundary of the you know the panel um, and then you would make that into a surface and then you would uh, float so that now you got to get these uh, curves to go from here to there, right? So now you got to get those in 2D. Then you have to tween those curves. Then you got to do the opposite. So now you got to do uh, flow again. You got to select those and go from here to here to get that back, right? So, okay, simple enough for this one panel, but if we're talking about something, you know, like this, where it's got all these complex sizes and shapes and all these panels, um, it can be quite challenging and quite time consuming. Uh, and that's why I started to develop this tool. And this tool really sparked the rest of, of Bufferfish. Uh, so here's like exactly what I explained here. Um, so it's like you could do all that for every single one, or you could make some kind of rule set, right? So I was able to define those rules. Again, like I was talking about before, if you could define the steps of your process, those steps can be automated. Um, so, you know, instead of doing all of this that we just did here, what I can do is I can just get uh, you know, something that I've made, um, and you can make it, you know, more uh, like through Grasshopper itself as well, uh, or some other tool. But in my case, it was easier to just uh, code it. So uh, I'll actually just go here and get it. Uh, so if you do like a tween uh, two curve on surface, because here we're just using two curves, for instance, um, there could be more. Uh, and there's also options for that. Uh, so you know, just set one, set one. Um, and then you just need your surface. And you can already see, you, you, you know, by default, you get one because there's one of the uh, factor there. Um, in this case, I'll just get the range. Uh, and there you go. So, you know, it's kind of doing something like this in code, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, this is probably this is way too many. So there you go. So there you go. It's automated. You can change, you know, you can change the amount. If you had to, if you had to change this curve for some reason, you can redraw it or just like move it. Um, if you had to change the surface, you can do that as well. So now everything's automated and you no more have to think about these uh, four or five manual steps to get that done. Uh, and then the other benefit is you can adjust and play with those things too. Um, algorithmically, I'll just show a simple example with like a, a graph, let's say. Right, so as I move these around, you know, I can get it like tighter there, looser there. It's naturally going to be tighter where, where, you know, the input curves are, are um, closer to each other. Uh, but you can see how that's moving there. So that's kind of the benefit there. <clears throat> um, you know, and the other, you know, and this is something I do a lot, and, and um, you know, even, you know, Grasshopper itself or Rhino itself, all the commands in Rhino or, or AutoCAD or, or, you know, Things in Grasshopper, they're all some kind of automation of something. They're they're usually you know combinations of, of tools. Um, 
you know, like for instance, if you did, uh, if you know, if you really think about it, if you did something that that you maybe don't think about all the time, like uh, offset, right? So if you're in a software like AutoCAD or or Rhino or or Revit or whatever, and you do offset, right? It's simple enough, okay? You just offset the thing. But what's happening behind the scenes is someone, the developer, you know kind of package all the things that are really happening together so you don't need to be aware of them or care about them because you don't care about them you just need to offset something but what really could be happening is it's like taking the taking the the, the curve um, it's finding the control points of that curve it's moving them a certain distance by a normal vector direction away from it uh, the input curve it's redrawing the new curve through the offset points. Uh, so there's all these things happening behind the scenes, right? So uh, even at the, the lower level of things, these kind of automated processes are happening in your in your workflows. Um, but there are a lot of those cases that are, are missed, uh, that bubble up to the surface as natural, um, kind of natural things that I think need to be automated. Uh, for instance, uh, if you go to the McNeil form and just type attractor, you'll get over 500 results of people trying to figure out how to make an attractor. So it's like at that point, these natural use cases could, you know, could also be automated. Um, and that's why you see with like, uh, with here, it's, it's like you can do all of this stuff here. Um, which again, even in Grasshopper, it's like to remember all that every time could be annoying. So you can cluster it, or you can do like I did here, which is write a script, uh, package it as a component, and never have to think about, you know, doing it manually or even building it in Grasshopper again. You just have to think about the information you need to provide there. And you know this kind of use case takes a lot of um, experience. Uh, in my case, you can see here I spend entirely way too much time on Grasshopper forums um, with seventy five point three thousand posts read, which is kind of crazy. Um, so and, you know, and then all the the events. So you know, for this kind of use case, where in in my case, where I'm distributing things and looking at what other people are doing. Uh, you know, you can try kind of see these trends. Um, but if it, in, in your case, you might uh, just be doing it for yourself. Uh, it's just always good to document your workflow. Um, and basically what I do is I have this here. Um, this is my uh, kind of map of grasshopper uh, puffer fish and how I made it. Um, this first little box over here is where it started. And then this on the other side of the dotted line is kind of where it's at now. So it's grown quite a bit. Um, but basically what I do is, and I actually have this open here. Um, you know, basically what I do is anytime I'm doing work, I'm working on a project, I'm working on a personal thing, uh, or I'm just curious and there's something I'm doing that I think, I, okay, I never want to do that again. Like, <laughs> I, I don't want to spend the time doing that again. Uh, I just want a tool for that. I'll just come through here and I usually write it like, you know, I still have some I haven't made, which I've written like down here, let's say. Uh, and then when I get time, I'll come back to it and make a, a tool from it. Um, and so this then becomes how Pufferfish gets made. It's basically all the things that. I do often or have done before and don't want to do them in a long um, kind of manual way again. Um, and I think actually even, um, <clears throat> let's see, if I look at the, this is the point, the one I was just showing you, the, the attractor one, the pinch and spread, um, you know, it ends up just being like this code. And this looks intimidating, but it's really not. Uh, once you you know understand code, uh, because you know I might have spent an afternoon 
making this and figuring it out and then a few versions of like fixing bugs and stuff but once it's there it's like you don't have to do that anymore so it, it's like maybe taking more time uh, up front but saving you a lot of time in the long run if it's something that you're doing or working with often um, and it's just it, again like because there's rules you can break those rules down into code or some kind of automation uh, and then you're you know you're good to go uh, even if you look also at the one we were just looking at here uh, <clears throat> Which is uh, let's see, uh, yeah. So that's this one here. So it's between two curve and surface, right? Like so, that's kind of all the stuff happening behind the scenes. Um, all the rules and, and documentation, basically. This is the, the computer rule set, but you can easily write these rules out in a simplified human way as well. Uh, and now I don't have to think about doing that anymore. I just I can just do it. Um, you know, and you know, not everything needs to be this kind of grand optimization. Even small things uh, can make a big impact on the way you work and the way others work. Um, things like you know, there's some very simple components in pufferfish uh, as well. Uh, for instance, like x minus one, which you would think is so simple, um, you know, and, but it's just, it's so common in programming because programming, you know, computers always, you know, start at zero uh, and you're often in like loops and scripting doing like, you know, some number minus one, uh, just kind of start at zero. Um, and so like a few of these things are so used so often that I just got tired of like subtracting one or like getting a thing, getting a subtraction component, plug it in one. Um, so I just made a quick thing. So I just put a number in and it just does it automatically. I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and, and this is my, th this is my kind of version of, um, I don't know if you're familiar where, where, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was saying that he wears the same kind of outfit every day because it's just one less thing he has to think about in the morning. Um, no, that's kind of this is my my wearing the same outfit, uh, not you know not the same clothing because obviously they're different clothes, but the same outfit every day. Just like things you don't have to think about anymore. Um, you can just use them and, and get on with what you're doing. Um, and they were kind of so. You know, when I first started making them, I was like, oh, do I really need these? And I, I even removed them in one version uh, and almost immediately got a bunch of emails saying, like, you know, please, you know, you know, don't remove them. I use them so much. I didn't even realize how impactful, you know, some of these very simple components were. Um, even the point where, like, I don't, you know, I realized a lot of people don't even know the math to get the percentage of something. And sometimes, you know, when I'm, you know, working a lot and late and tired, like even these simple maths can be, you know, annoying to think about where you just were just like, like, just give me the answer. It's kind of like a tip calculator when you have to leave a tip at a restaurant or something. It's the same idea. It's like you can do it if you really wanted to, but, you know, can't the answer just be there? Um, now, the, the important things to, uh, you know, the important things to think about uh, when you are making workflows and tools is you want to break these things down uh, into kind of into chunks because um, you also don't want to automate so much um, that you or a user is locked into one specific kind of system and can only do things one way. So that's why you see here, like you don't have a computer component Though in the case of uh, in the case of this uh, thing that you see here on the left, uh, you don't have just one thing that just does it, and you also don't want it like always just have all the inputs and it just does the singular thing. 
Uh, you have to think about making things automated, but in a way that they're flexible to be used. So that that's kind of the challenge is that like, how do you break these things up? Um, and you know, I I try to say you know if if it if it only outputs kind of like one aesthetic or one type of thing, you can probably think about how to how to break that up to allow more um, input. So in this case, instead of one component that you just you know plug things in and you get you know from this surface to this here. What I broke it down into, okay, it's like first is like how do we get the the places, like how do we panelize the thing, like breaking up into panels, and then another component, let's say that helps you design the panels, and then another component that helps you apply the panels to the kind of breakdown grid. So in this case, you have three, you know, separate logics, and then you know other logics also that can be used so that if you wanted to somehow create a different panel, you can use something like this to create a panel, or you could even not use this uh, between mesh geometry panels and just use whatever uh, you know panel you want, however you created it. You can inject that into the system and you know, just use these two. Or if you had another way of making the grid, you can do that, or you can use the kind of setup that that I've made here, um, and then same for the morphing. So you want to allow kind of flexibility and interchangeability also in the workflow. Um, so there is a thing like automating, but not automating, uh, like not over over automated. You know, and you can look at things like if you're familiar with ladybug tools, uh, which is a optimization. Um, you know, it's an optimization tool. Uh, for environmental analysis. Um, and again, it's not just like you plug one thing in and you get all of the weather information. Out. It's broken down into chunks. There's like things that, that prepare the geometry, things that analyze the, the geometry, things that make the simulation, and then things that visualize the result. And there are all these chunks that are kind of plug and play back and forth. But the, the idea is that to draw a sun path, for instance, here, you're not actually having to figure out how to draw a sun path. You're just giving the information and a sun path as output. And then you can decide if you want to use that sun path um, for some kind of analysis also down the line. Um, and it's very similar with what Revit is doing. Um, you know, Revit's not just like, here's a building. It's like, okay, here's walls, here's floors, here's stairs, here's windows. Don't worry about how they connect. Just put them and design them and we'll figure out for you, you know, how a window goes into a wall, how two walls meet at a corner construction wise, uh, right? So it's a set of inputs you're putting in, you know, very different from, you know, CAD, right? So this is moving into BIM. Um, but again, it's it's all about those automations. Like why you you don't need to care every time how a wall meets another wall if the construction is standard and you can define the construction type. Uh, you know, there's rules there, so let the software figure that out, and you spend the time um, you know defining uh, and laying out the space, the spacing. Um, you know, and so there, there's, uh, you know, there's some tools out there that also get used, like, kind of in unexpected or weird ways, which is one of the big one is a Voronoi. Uh, and even Grasshopper has a funny little message if you use this too much that it's telling you, like, basically stop using it so much. Um, you know, the Voronoi is, is probably one of the most important um concepts in terms of spatial relationships uh that there is because that's i mean that's what it's made for um kind of creating and defining spaces based on location and adjacencies um but it also happens to make uh, a very interesting or at one time interesting pattern so it often gets misused as just kind of uh 
aesthetic purposes, um, well, mis and overused. <clears throat> um, so it's also something you want to be careful of. Uh, you know, in the Voronoi's case, it doesn't really have an option. That's what it, you know, that's what it does. But you want to make sure the things that you're making uh, or optimizing don't just lock you into one kind of result. So like the, the best kind of tools uh, have, you know, many results. They're they're open to many results, um, and it's the system that's kind of you know locked in and defined. Um, and this is just a very funny, very funny meme just pertaining to this, where finds 3D component completes design thesis. It's just like a funny kind of situation there. Um, you know, uh, here's another uh, another tool I I've created, which turns like freeform flowing curvature into hard edge and hard edge and def curvature defined specifically. Um, by different angles. Um, and so that's something that's really confusing to figure out, uh, and quite annoying to figure out manually. Um, or even as a grasshopper script, you could do something like this uh, as a definition, many components, uh, or you can just write small script. Um, and because you can def define the logic, Right, so you divide a curve into points. You calculate the source vector between each point. You measure the angle difference between each source vector to each target vector. Choose the target vector, smallest vector, angle, and source vectors. Replace the source with the target, and then draw a new polyline. Right. So, you know, kind of the point I'm trying to drive home here is as as you're all doing work, like you, whether subconsciously or consciously, understand in a way or figuring out how to do something and there's a process there so any chance you get to automate it like just you should try to automate it because then you don't have to do that uh, again and waste time uh, with that you know so what the logic is of you know for something like that is basically it's like if i have this curve um i'll just go to the top view in this case if I have this curve and I break it down, let's say into into points. Now, say I want to just draw this curve in a way, uh, like how can we interpret this curve in a way that's only drawn by ninety, you know, ninety degree angles? Um, what you would do is you can do something like, you know, how do you get from here to there? Uh, or even like 45 degree angles um, could be something like that was 45 degrees. And, uh, I'm not drawing exactly 45 degrees here, but you can kind of understand the point here. It could be something like something like that. Like if we only wanted 45 degree angle in, like increments, well, that could be really annoying to figure out. Uh, obviously, what I just draw there is just for the sake of time just quick for representational, but it's obviously not just 45 degrees. Um, and then also every time I change the curve or whatever, like I have to have to redo that, which could be, you know, super, super annoying. Uh, but there is a logic that you can understand and the logic is, well, my options, my options for directions are basically, um, just see. So those are my options, right? That's that's my options for which direction I can move. Um, so if you were to place this kind of at every point. You could use that as kind of like a guide, and you you would say like, okay, how do I get as close as possible to this point with only using these angles? Well, you would first draw something like that, right? Like a line from point to point, and then you would say, okay, which angle is closest to that angle? And in this case, it's it's this one here. So you might be drawing something. Uh, 
you know, a line like that until you get like close to this point. Um, but you have to do that at every point, which is kind of just ridiculous, honestly. Um, so the other thing you can do is, uh, you know, you can code up that logic, uh, and you could do something like what I have here, which is a discrete line. Um, and you just have like, uh, let's see. So you have those points, uh, and then you have your vector target vectors, right? So this is your your target vectors are like to only move in those forty five degree increments. Uh, and I actually, you know, you know, in Pufferfish also has like the um, setups like that. So that's what I'm talking about, like breaking it down into chunks. Um, I can use something like this, uh, or actually, I'll just get this one here and uh, set this to um, true. So you can see it like down here, right? So it's it's basically giving you those vectors ready, right? So that's a way you break those down right? uh, into two components so that there's flexibility in the system. Um, and we can say number something like that, right? So that's three, what we want maybe you know, this isn't uh, 45 exactly, but you'll see the point um, right there, right? So now we've created that automatically, you know, through that logic, you know? And obviously it's not gonna hit every point because that's not the logic, like, because basically what that's saying is there's no way to go from this point to this point to the 45 degree angle uh, or whatever angle this is using now. Um, so, it's just going to try to be as close as possible to get, to reach those points, All right? So, but the important thing is you don't have to think about that anymore. It just it solves it for you because there was a logic you understood that logic and you wrote that logic down to a computer and you're good. Um, another important thing when making tools is um, consistency in your. Uh, <clears throat> in the way things work. For instance, I have all of these components of our fish which deal with blending. And the blending amount is always called factor. It's really important, especially if you want other users to be using um, your workflows, is that things are named consistently. You wouldn't want to call something a factor in one place, something a, a blend amount in another place, something, a, a, I don't know, some other name in another place. So. Things should be like consistent. If you look at Powerfish, like the, you know, the, the things are usually in the same order. Like if it's a color, it's like color A, color B factor. If it's a curve, curve A, curve B factor. Um, if it's a domain, <coughs> domain A, domain B factor. Uh, plane, plane A, plane B factor. And then there's you know other options depending on the type. There might be more or less options. But the importance is that consistency across the across the system. Um, another important aspect um, is, you know, making things identifiable and user friendly. Um, you know, there's, you know, these are the pufferfish icons here. Uh, they're all uniquely identifiable, uh, and you can learn them uh, pretty easily. Um, versus, you know. These other, there's some other plugins uh, that are actually very, very good and advanced plugins, um, but there's no time taken kind of on the user interface or everything. For instance, like the robots up here, it looks the same. Uh, so when you do something like that, you give kind of, uh, you give an unnecessary bottleneck to the user uh, and also to yourself. Uh, like if I had made this, if I, I myself wouldn't remember what I did easily. Uh, because all of it looks the same. And also, you know, just giving descriptions to, uh, giving the strip, you know, descriptions to things so people understand what they're using, or you even remember what, what the input is or what you're using versus here where it's just like, there's not really information on the inputs uh, and outputs here. Uh, 
where if you look here, like there's kind of um, uh, like if you hover here, like there's kind of always information. Uh, and I try to be as descriptive as possible about like what thing needs uh, and you know what it's called and how to use it. Um, so that's another important thing too to consider if you're if you're giving this your 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 workflow uh, to others is that they need to understand easily how to use it. Uh, but even just good practice for yourself as well because um, you know even when you're writing code, you see these green lines here. You're kind of commenting what you did um, because if I don't do that, uh, and it's you know why a lot of programmers do that is because you can write a code and then have to go back to it a year from when you made it and if you don't have these kind of informations, it's even hard to remember what you yourself were doing or did. Um, and that, you know, brings me to the next thing is like to always be conscious of updating and keeping up with your workflows if they need be. Um, you know, I've had components like the, the tween through uh, curves, which is just like a way to tween or blend through multiple curves that started with, you know, in this case, 117 lines of code and it's currently at 540 lines of code so you keep adding every time you find someone break it or a way that you've broken it uh, you go and you fix those things uh, to always keep you know keep, again keep the flow of that optimization going um, <clears throat> and a really funny you know a really funny example is when i made this kind of mirror cutting of meshes uh, which basically cuts a mesh in half, uh, mirrors it, and then blends it together. Um, when I first made it, I was I was quite happy with it, and then I released it, and like a few minutes later, um, someone broke it and realized it doesn't work with open um, with open meshes. It was just like something I completely overlooked. So that's important too. Is like when you make a workflow, uh, if you are to distribute it. Uh, to make sure that you test it against as many use cases uh, as you can think of, and also maybe distribute it to a small amount of people to find these things first. Um, so after that, you can see the the inputs here were four, and they got you know a lot more. There was a lot more options, um, but things worked. You know, things worked a lot better because they were able to work with. Um, Work with. I just want to get to it because for some reason those ones aren't animating. I think it's because they're. Oh, there we go. So then you get to work with all these kind of different cases right, in an automated way. So the other thing is examples, right? You want to. You want to. Remind yourself how to use things, first of all. Uh, so good to document that, but also good to document for a user, like examples, so they know how to use them. And this is kind of like what the Pufferfish example files look like. Um, there's just examples for every kind of component, and then different also workflow examples, and they're all like listed out, labeled. This is just a zoom in of one where you can see it's got like notes explaining everything and how to do things. Uh, Video examples help as well. I just didn't have time for them. And video examples are hard to update when something's a work in progress because the the videos can become quickly outdated and then you have to record a new video. Um, but definitely like document your workflow, if not for someone else, at least for yourself, again, just so you remember what you were doing. Um, and these are just some some examples of things that you can generate very quickly with once you know you make these tools these very complex things in my case like a lot of experimentation of complex geometry um just trying to uh you know push the limits of the tools see what they can you know come up with and create uh and even funny like there's people making memes they sent me for pufferfish uh, <laughs> that they're you know calling the example fire definitions as fire uh, so I find a lot of these really funny uh, that they send to me. Um, so it's really nice to see like people using the tools and how it helps them. Um, 
another thing uh, that I just don't want to overlook, not specifically on topic, but just to make sure you always credit the people uh, that you maybe get ideas from, because anything you make in this case, especially when it comes to like coding and some of that, you're always finding little snippets here and there from different sources or consulting with people. So make sure you just always credit everyone that you can, same way as if you were writing a, a paper, a research paper. Um, and yeah, this is just going back to what I was saying, like to make sure you update, uh, you know, update your, your, your thing, try to find bugs every time you find them and just keep improving the workflows. Uh, and then these are a bunch of examples of of uh, things that I didn't make, just things that people have made with my tools. Um, and this is what the, the real joy for me is personally, is like seeing what other people do with it that I maybe wouldn't have done with it or didn't think about doing with it or all the kind of different use cases, which is really interesting to me. Um, from like, I don't know, robot heads to these kind of conceptual massings to uh, uh, graphic prints, to like lamp kind of stuff, um, to walls, and jewelry, and you know, conceptual art, um, furniture, um, pavilions. <clears throat> One guy even uh, sent me a tattoo he made with pufferfish on him, so it was kind of to me funny that like a tool I made is kind of forever imprinted on, on his body. Um, uh, you have footwear, which is what not in footwear now. Uh, you know, so just kind of all kinds of different things that people end up doing with it. It's just really, kind of, for me, liberating. And for them as well, uh, there was even, you know, one guy, uh, who was using pufferfish to remake uh, a bunch of, you know, interesting architecture uh, facades that we're familiar with, like this one from Zaha, um, or this one from Dillard's video. Uh, so just kind of remaking them with Grasshopper and pufferfish. So I thought, thought that was really cool. Um, and then there's, you know stuff that we do in design morphine and you know since i've made my fish a lot of the tutors are using it as well um in their you know you know i'm, I'm not saying our fish is the sole reason that these were able to be made but a lot of it's been incorporated into the workflows um, these are like our kind of more fabricated stuff here um, more designy stuff here um, and then there's a lot of, uh, you know, the interesting, th the other interesting thing for me is once it got to some point, I didn't even have to make the uh, examples and tutorials anymore. Um, people were using it uh, so much that they were making their own tutorials about it as well. So now people are even making their own pufferfish tutorials uh, at some of these places. Uh, and then there's just some of the stuff I am doing with it too, like making, I like to look a lot at like this kind of weird um, conceptual jewelry uh, and fashion, a um, bunch of concept stuff. I'm, my stuff's always kind of pretty abstract with with uh, um, a fish, uh, mainly because I'm just trying to see like what weird kind of things I could do. That's a good way to see like how things break and their, their limitations. Um, but I also just like this kind of aesthetic of this kind of avant-garde uh, products um, and architecture. And, uh, you know, I don't put like the stuff I do, especially at like Nike or anything like that, because obviously I can't you know, put that stuff really online until it's completed. Um, so I just spend a lot of time, you know, and I don't have the time to like make architecture every time because architecture just takes a long time so i spend a lot of time with abstract objects just seeing how things work uh, focusing mostly on the tool uh, and the logics of the tool and refining the tool because if you can do some kind of crazy geometry successfully it's it's a lot easier than to come back and do some more simpler um, geometry
So this is just some of the stuff uh, that I do here. Uh, and then even into using it even into uh, product design. Uh, this was a wedding crown that we made uh, for for my wedding, which was part of the tradition of the, the wedding, just worn on the head and uh, was made entirely with uh, pufferfish uh, components and then 3D printed and worn. Uh, and then this lamp here with uh, me, uh, Pavlina, and Arturo Tedeschi, um, which was using, I also got pufferfish uh, combined with 3D printing and also combined with manual modeling. So it does like a lot of integration, but the this kind of core component was possible just because of pufferfish. Um, we use the geometry, we used uh, data for kind of how the fused light would work in, inside of the kind of core to 3D print. Um, but it would have taken a very long time without, without those tools. Here you can see some of that. And, and also because of those tools, we were able to version very quickly. So you can see here on like the lower left, two different versions. I mean, there was like hundreds of versions. Uh, but in the end, we, we settled with the uh, kind of simpler one strictly because of the, the glass manufacturing and what was capable because the glass is actually hand handmade uh, glass in, from Murano, Italy. So uh, we couldn't do anything crazy with the, the kind of perimeter and shape of that. It had a, a, a lot more limitation than, say, something like 3D printing. Uh, and you can see that here, these kind of... Um, kind of guide molds that they used for the glass, um, the glass uh, shaping. Uh, and that brings me to also like the uh, uh, the first kind of shoe that I had out with Nike, which is the Kyrie 7, um, where a, a lot of those aspects <clears throat> I also was using um, pufferfish for. Uh, in this case, in, you know, inputting like, performance information. So, you know, in the case of using the tools I made, again, just like the grid, I was just inputting the information and outputting the result rather than having to like draw and figure out all every step each time. Um, which brings to an, an interesting thing is, uh, and what I'm interested in is, you know, that all this stuff is kind of uh, in, in computational design, it's kind of branching outside of architecture. Um, if you even look at, at like uh, just Grasshopper, and Grasshopper is not nearly the only software for this. You have like Dynamo, Grasshopper, Houdini, just scripting, and then many other, other software. But if you just look at Rhino, yeah, I mean, you can see how many different fields that this is branching into uh, Grasshopper, let's say. Uh, like parametric computational design, uh, you know, architecture in this case is is the biggest. But I mean, there's so many other places that this stuff is used and valued, um, and that just brings me to this. I mean, it, it's really just like a change of scale, um, and I like to show this example of this kind of same pattern on automotive footwear tattoo. Uh, or architecture, or it can be jewelry, furniture, sculpture. So, like for me, that you know, having these workflows, these skill sets, and this kind of problem solving mentality, well, when I moved from an architecture office and then two weeks later was at a footwear product design company like Nike, uh, there was really no issue with just jumping right into the work. I mean, it felt like just kind of moved right into it. It wasn't hard because the tools I was using, um, the tools I was using in the workflows were were pretty much the same. The, the difference was the uh, the kind of manufacturing output. Um, and it could all start something like this. If you look at this nice plugin uh, called Parakeet, which automates all these very complex patterns, uh, you just kind of input a simple shape and it repeats and tiles them in all kinds of creates different ways based on some parameters. Again, like it would be so painful to draw like a grid like this. And then if you have to make a little, one little change, draw it again, 
where you can think of the logic a bit differently, where it's like a piece or a tile, and that thing can be, you know, distributed and manipulated in different ways through information and data. Um, and like I said, it just comes down to the manufacturing. Right? Like it's if, if it's for a facade, you might have to think about material thickness and, and often cost and refitability. Uh, for something like a product or footwear design, you'd think about the kind of molding or injection uh, tolerances. For something like automotive, you think about like what's capable for automation of a robot to do because uh, if it's too complex for robots, no one's going to sit there and hand detail are in this day and age for the most part. Uh, if it's for a tattoo, you consider things like how detailed can an ink gun get? Uh, or if it's something just purely for visualization, then you're just thinking about like how many polygons or like what's your scene, the heaviness of your scene and how can you optimize to lay out textures. So just as a successful tool recap, like uh, I would say like always make sure you're, you're thinking about you're not just doing the work, but you're thinking about and documenting your workflow. This will help you take shortcuts uh, if the next time you have to do these things. Uh, and then try to break down that workflow into modular processes and list those out step by step. There's nothing better than a list. If you can list something like step one, step two, step three, then, then you can definitely automate. Um, consistency in use and expectations. Um, make things easily identifiable to a user, uh, anticipate different use cases and conditions, have a clear and thoughtful documentation uh, for a user, test it thoroughly with other users, um, credit people who are helping uh, along the way, and then release the tool and distribute it. Um, and if this all sounds scary, I, I like to put this here, uh, this meme here, and it can be applied to anything. It doesn't need to be code. Like I said, there's other ways to optimize your workflow just by thinking about them and, and you know, maybe make even just documenting it so you don't have to refigure it out the next time even if you're still doing it manually uh but it's like you just gotta you know you just gotta like do it you know like you, that's that's the way um uh, and so you can follow me more uh on instagram at design morphine and my personal Instagram at Ikamroy, which is actually just my name backwards because forwards was taken, um, <clears throat> funny enough, by the uh, CEO of, uh, what is it, uh, Trello, which I think has the same name as me. Um, and um, before you know, closing with that, I just want to... Um, bring up this because you know uh which is our website design working website because this whole this whole idea about uh you know computational design workflow optimization kind of new way of being a designer which is like a um a system a system and workflow uh, developer um uh, rather than a kind of manual process maker um and you know someone that creates things that are considered like always in flux rather than static um that we you know we at design morphine have actually created a, a master's degree which we've got fully uh, approved and credited nine months uh online master's degree program in uh computational and advanced design um, and our standpoint uh, and it's, it's fully online as well and our standpoint is like let's look at computational design as a field of, of its own. So it's not specifically tied to architecture or to anything else. I mean, of course, there's architecture elements in the program and fashion elements in the program and, and uh, vehicle design elements in the program. And it's also up to the students how to interpret it. The idea is like, let's look at this as a kind of universal, skill set that can be applied across you know any design challenge um, so if you're interested in that definitely go to our website and check it out um, there's a lot of you know great tutors from zaha d architects big and, and uh, nike of course and, and other 
you know, industries and fields. Um, so definitely check that out. And then the other thing I want to point out um, is that we have uh, four webinars coming up, um, which today is the last day for early bird uh, registration pricing. Um, generative topologies, which is using Fusion 360 uh, and Grasshopper to create uh, optimized structural and generative design pieces from existing objects. So how do you take, if you took a chair, what does that chair look like if you uh, let a computer design it through the lens of strictly performance? What does the structure look like? What does the you know, material look like? Uh, biomorphic networks, which, about, which is about designing by the logic of slime molds. I don't know if you've ever seen slime mold, but it's this mold that kind of grows in the most efficient pathways based on trying to reach its food. Uh, fragmented fiction, which is looking at Houdini uh, for procedural modding, and then elaborate sinuosity, which is about uh, learning how to model um, uh, both manually and parametrically with Autodesk Maya. Um, and then we also have our CDNX4 conference coming up as well. So be sure to check all those things out. Uh, and yeah, so that's my presentation there. So uh, let's see, is there any, any questions? Does anyone have any questions they want to ask here? Trying to see if these are the only. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I certainly enjoyed presenting to you. Cool. Well, if there's no further questions, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I'm available often through Instagram. Shoot me a message if you have any questions about anything. Uh, and I just want to thank again. Uh, I just want to thank again uh, the MadCon team and Sana for inviting me, uh, having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, and good luck on the rest of your event. Mm -hmm.